Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> so, to summarize what we did last time, I uh, introduced a sort of index, not a sort of index, an index on uh, BPS, on, on representations of the n equals 2 superalgebra called the protected spin character. So it vanishes on long representations, non-BPS representations, and it's not zero on BPS representations and given by this kind of trace where J3 is a generator of rotations in space and curly J3 is the diagonal combination of a generator of the diagonal combination of spatial rotations and SU2R symmetry rotations. If you don't have an SU2R symmetry, you can still define a BPS index, omega of gamma u, which in the case where you do have a protected spin character is just putting y equals minus 1. Then we went into a nice little physical calculation in the probe approximation where I showed you that BPS particles can form bound states. And in fact, they are BPS bound states. So that's a key physical point that two BPS particles can form a bound state, which is itself BPS. And that a bound state of particles of electromagnetic charges, gamma 1 and gamma 2, can decay and can only decay across walls of marginal stability. And those are, by definition, the places of the points U in the Coulomb branch, where the central charge of gamma 1 as a complex number is parallel to the central charge of gamma 2. And if you account for the states that you lose, where at least in the case when gamma 1 and gamma 2 are primitive, then you get the primitive wall crossing formula where the change in this protected spin character as you cross a wall of marginal stability is the product of the, of the index for the two constituents and then this character of the which I think of as the character of the SU2 representation carried by the uh, electromagnetic field. OK, now, as I was saying in answer to various questions, that's clearly not the end of the story because we can have more complicated bound states than just uh, two primitive charges of charge gamma 1 and gamma 2. And that's what we're going to address today. So the problem is that when we cross a wa marginal stability wall for gamma 1 and gamma 2, that can also be the marginal stability wall for n gamma 1 and gamma 2 and, sorry, n1 gamma 1 and n2 gamma 2, where n1 and n2 are, say, integers of the same sign. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to derive today a formula that takes into account all of the changes of the indices due to all the complicated bound states. It's a very non-trivial statement, and it's called the konsevich soibelman wall crossing formula. And their paper is, is very mathematical, and what I'm going to do today is as a result of actually some rather recent insights give you what I consider a, to be a very nice physical derivation. Uh, a derivation which really makes a good physical sense to me. And this derivation applies both in the field theory case and in the gravity case. Now, in a paper I wrote with Davide Gaiato and Andy Knightsky, called Framed BPS Degeneracies, or Framed BPS States, we realized that by studying supersymmetric line operators in n equals 2 supersymmetric theories, we could actually give, it was really a corollary of what we were actually doing, we could give a ni this nice physical derivation of the konsevich soibelman wall crossing formula, and in fact we could do it for the spin characters 
the protected spin characters, the so-called motivic uh, conservative Slobelman wall crossing formula. But today, because it fits in much better with the other lectures, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an argument that uses a similar idea but generalizes it to supergravity, and that's in a paper that should appear in a few days with my student Yevgeny Andriash, Frederick Deneff, and uh, Dan Jeferis, and myself. And so we're going to do the supergravity case. Now, as I stressed several times, and I will say again at the end of the lecture, we don't have a uh, SU2R symmetry in general in supergravity, so we restrict our attention first to BPS indices, and then at the end, if there's time, I'll say how it would go if you do have an SU2R symmetry and how you get the full uh, motivic Kontsevich Soibelman wall crossing formula. Okay, so today we're doing supergravity. So I want to begin with um, the multicentered solutions of n equals 2 supergravity. So we have n equals 2 supergravity coupled to abelian vector multiplets. And uh, what are the fields? Well, the bosonic fields are the metric, g mu nu. And then we have the vector multiplet scalars, which I'll again denote u, and they're functions of space-time. And then we again have the gauge field, which is best thought of in the self-dual formalism. So it's a two-form on space-time valued in a symplectic vector space. V, where V is gamma tensor R, just like before. But there's a, little, uh, there's a little detail here compared to what happens in field theory. You see, in the n equals 2 supergravity multiplet, there is a U1 gauge field. It's called the gravophoton. Okay? So if I have R, a rank R uh, gauge group, for the vector multiplets, then, in fact, my full gauge group is R plus 1 gauge group because of the gravophoton from the gravity multiplet. And so the rank of capital gamma is 2R plus 2. That's, remember, electric and magnetic charges, and so V is a 2R plus 2 dimensional vector space. Nevertheless, the complex dimension of the Coulomb branch is just R. There are R vector multiplet scalars. So, for example, a key example that leads to this n equals 2 supergravity is type 2A superstrings on a Calabi Yau manifold X, in which case um, V is h even of x with real coefficients. And um, r is equal to the second Betty number of x. Do you mean su r plus 1 gauge group? I most certainly do not. I'm talking about an abelian gauge group. OK? So we're on the Coulomb branch here. So we only have abelian vector multiplets. All right. So that's the n equals 2 supergravity. And now we want to write some multicentered solutions. These are, again, due to Deneff. So what, the, what space time are they defined on? Well, we're just going to define them on r3 times r. So we're just going to use good old vector x and t as a point in R3 times R. They're going to be asymptotically Minkowskian, but the metric is spinning and warped. So we write it as e to the 2u 
dt plus theta squared plus e to the minus 2u d vector x squared, where capital U, the warp factor, is a function of on R3, and theta is a one form on R3, and so you see the t theta components give you the spin of the metric. Okay? And I said we have asymptotically Minkowski space, so one of our boundary conditions is that u of x goes to 0 as x goes to infinity. What is? H e. H e. Oh, that's the even degree cohomology. OK? H0 plus H2 plus H4 plus H6. Still a question? Why is what? Well, yeah, that's a bit of a story. I'm simply telling you that that's the result. Um, you have to study what type 2 AD brains, you have to study the uh, compactification of 10 dimensional type 2 A supergravity on a Calabi Yau manifold and see what the vector fields are that come out. And the Kaluza Klein reduction of the Ramon Ramon fields will give you that. Because you know there are these abelian gauge fields in 10 dimensional type 2 supergravity which have various p form gauge fields, right? I think you had the Beckers talking, I thought, about this kind of thing. So uh, if you, so that's a result from type 2A supergravity. Yep? I, could, I couldn't hear you. Huh? Yes. It, well, you have it. it you have the, the duality group is S P two R plus two Z, and so you have those exactly those kinds of duality transformations. That's right. It's non-trivial. It's non-trivial. It mixes those things up. Okay. So we have that. And now, in order to define a multicentered solution, we need the following data. One is a boundary condition for our vector multiplet scalars. So as x goes to infinity, they go to some u infinity on the Coulomb branch. And the other, this is key, is a set of what are called centers, x sub j. And those centers are each endowed with an electromagnetic charge, gamma j, where j goes from 1 to n. n is anything you like. OK? So what do our fields look like? Well, we have a dionic gauge field. It's going to be very similar to what we had before. And, um, and now, in order to write the formula that determines the vector multiplets, uh, let's do the following. I've stressed that the central charge is linear, and so that can be written as an inner product with a vector, since uh, the uh, symplectic form is non-degenerate, and this is called the period vector. So knowing the period vector is the same as knowing the vector multiplets. Now, what we do is we use that data up there to write a harmonic function h from R3 into this vector space v, where h is the sum from j equals 1 to n of gamma j over x minus x sub j minus twice the imaginary part of e to the minus i alpha infinity omega sub infinity. Okay, so I just write that. And uh, what's alpha infinity? e to the i alpha infinity is equal to the phase of z of the sum of all the charges at u infinity. And now we write the a very important equation, 2 e to the minus u of x times the imaginary part of e to the minus i alpha of x period vector at x is equal to minus h of x. 
Or if you find that a little too abstract, you can take an inner product of that equation with any uh, charge gamma and, and write an equivalent equation, imaginary part of e to the minus i alpha of x, z sub gamma of u of x is equal to minus the sum of gamma inner product gamma j over x minus xj plus the value of this thing at infinity. So I'll just write sub infinity. What that means is you take this and you simply evaluate at x equals infinity. And of course, at x equals infinity, this term goes away. OK, so these two equations are exactly the same equation. Now, the important thing about these equations is that that completely determines the warp factor u of x and the vector multiplet scalars little u of x for every x. OK, so this equation, which looks complicated and is complicated, determines the vector multiplet scalars and the warp factor. Now, to complete the solution, or at least the ansatz for the solution, I have to tell you something about that theta. And the BPS equations tell us that star 3 d theta has to be equal to this dh symplectic inner product h. And then from that, we get a very important consistency condition because you see, you could bring the star 3 to the other side. You could take d of this, d squared is 0. And then h is harmonic. And you work that out. And you get a condition on the centers, consistency condition in order to solve this, which is the sum over j such that j is not equal to i of gamma i gamma j over xi minus xj is equal to twice the imaginary part minus i alpha infinity z sub gamma i of u infinity. That's true for all i. OK, and so that's it. So, it's complicated, but it is quite an impressive solution of n equals 2 supergravity. Now, in order to get some physical intuition for what's going on, let's look at some special cases. So let's first look at a single center. So if I have a single center, then this equation here becomes radially symmetric so it just becomes 2 e to the minus u of r, imaginary e to the minus i alpha of r, z gamma of u of r equals minus gamma, let's call the one charge at the one center gamma c. And then we have this thing at infinity for all gamma. This is called the attractor equation. Beautiful equation of Ferrara, Kalash, and Strominger. It says that uh, these vector multiplets are varying as, we, as we, we start out at infinity from the black hole. We specify some boundary condition u infinity for our vector multiplets. And as we travel inwards, the vector multiplets evolve. OK? And indeed, you can see that this term here is blowing up so that the warp factor e to the u of r is going like r as r goes to 0. And that means that the tt component of the metric is going to 0. So r equals 0 is the horizon. And at the horizon, once you factor out that r, you have twice imaginary part of e to the minus alpha star, um, z sub gamma of u star is equal to, um, actually it's better to write it in terms of the period matrix, which is why I introduced the period matrix. You get two imaginary part of e to the minus i alpha star, period matrix star is equal to gamma c. And what's really significant about that 
is that you see, no matter what you choose for your vector multiplet moduli out at radius infinity, when you get to the horizon, they go to a fixed point, that's why it's called the attractor equation, which only depends on the electromagnetic charge. So if you start out here at r equals infinity with some crazy shaped Calabi Yau, okay, no matter how crazy you make the shape of the Calabi Yau, by the time you get to r equals zero, it's some nice Calabi Yau, which is determined entirely by the charge. Yes, correct. OK, so we got that. Now let's graduate to two centers. OK? What happens if we have two centers? Well, if we have two centers, then look at this H. You see, when X is near one of the two centers, this pole term is going to dominate. And therefore, the solution is going to look very close to x equals x1, like the single centered black hole with the charge gamma 1 at x1, right? Because that's the dominant term. And h determines everything. And similarly, when we go to x equals x2, the other term dominates. And the solution's going to look very much like the dion at, with charge gamma 2 at x equals x2. So what do we got here? We've got a BPS bound state of these two dionic black holes. Just what I said we would have last time. And moreover, look what this constraint equation tells you. There's only one equation here, because i is not equal to j. And if you look at that, that's exactly Deneff's formula. So that's r12 equals gamma1 gamma2. Uh, the absolute value of z1 plus z2 over twice the imaginary part of z1 z2 bar. That's Deneff's formula, and that's how he derived it. Now, what about the general case? So, in the general case, well, we have a bunch of points all over the place in R3. We have uh, xj here with some charge gamma j, it's complicated, okay? But one thing we know is that as x goes near xj, that particular pole term dominates, so near that center it looks like a dionic black hole. And so what we have here is a very complicated bound state of many centers of many dionic black holes, it's BPS, so in general, its binding energy is negative. So you've got this kind of molecule made out of dionic black holes. That's the way to think about this. Now in general, these equations here are very hard to solve if you, if you just give some charges and look at these constraints on the centers. It's, it's quite fascinating, in fact. They're very hard to solve. but. Um, there's one case, one significant case, in which they're not so hard to solve. And that will be very important to us. And that's the so-called halo configurations. So let's take one center at x equals 0 with a charge, let's call it gamma c for core. And let's suppose all the other centers, xj, have charge lambda j gamma sub h where lambda j is some positive number. So all the other charges, except for the core charge, are parallel charge vectors. Well, then you see that this equation simplifies a lot, because these guys all have zero inner product with themselves. So there's only one term here on the left-hand side of the equation. And then they are all solved by saying that there's a single radius, r equals gamma c gamma h, 1 over twice the imaginary part of e to the minus i alpha, z gamma h. And all of the centers have to lie on a sphere of that radius. Here's x equals 0. Here's this radius. And all these centers are lying on this, this sphere. And moreover, those are the only constraints on the centers. So the centers can be anywhere they want on that sphere. 
They just have to be at that radius. So now, because of that, let's think about what are the quantum states that we associate with these halo configurations. So we've been doing classical field theory. So now I want to think about the quantum states. OK, so one thing to say is that we have this gamma C and we have this gamma H out here. And by an electromagnetic duality transformation, we can think of the gamma C as a monopole charge and the gamma H as an electron charge. So what have we got here? We've got electrons confined to a sphere of some fixed radius moving in a magnetic field, constant magnetic field of a monopole. That's a famous problem. It's also a problem on the set of problems I, I gave you to think about long ago. Because I'm not going to go through the details right now, but if you did that problem, you know that there's a Landau level degeneracy. OK? And the, uh, the space of quantum states is an irreducible representation of rotations of dimension gamma c, let's say lambda gamma h. So if I take a halo particle of charge lambda gamma h, if I just think about it as a point particle of charge lambda gamma h, then that's how many quantum states it has. Except, of course, it might have internal degrees of freedom. Right? It might also be true that this particle itself has internal degrees of freedom. So this BPS space could be the half hypermultiplet tensor, one of these spaces that we've been talking about there. So let's just focus on the quantum states available to a single halo particle. That's what we're trying to understand the quantum states of a single halo particle. So we have the Landau level degeneracy, but we also have what I'm calling the internal degeneracy. Now to understand that, we have to look at this half hypermultiplet in a slightly new way from what we've said before. Last time, the first lecture, I just got at it in a purely representation point of view. What is the physical meaning of that rho HH? What it is, is it represents the quantum states of the center of mass of the particle, the BPS particle of charge lambda gamma h. You see, this rho hh is a Z2 graded space, so it has a bosonic space and a fermionic space. This is C2, which is R4, which is the center of mass position in space-time. And this is also C2, and it has to do with the spin degrees of freedom. Now, again, with, think about the electron in the field of a monopole. That spin degree of freedom is itself frozen. That spin must point radially inward. So the rho is completely frozen in this Landau level problem. And so the space of states, the space of quantum states, of a halo particle of charge lambda gamma h is j sub gamma c lambda gamma h times this internal space lambda gamma h. So that's some finite dimensional vector space. And then I told you that we can just add these particles in at will, and they don't interact. They're all BPS. What does that mean? That means if I want to say, what is the quantum state associated to n of these things, it's an n, it's a n particle Fox space. It's a state in an n particle Fox space. Because what is a Fox space? It means you have non-interacting, a bunch of non-interacting particles. So that's what I've got here. I've got a bunch of non-interacting particles, and I'm telling you what are the quantum states of each particle. OK? So now, since it is a Fox space, it's wise to 
put them all together, put all particle numbers together. So let's call these, these states halo quantum states of charge gamma C plus N gamma H. And just to, for fun, you could put in a formal parameter Q here to count gamma H number. And what I'm saying is that it's the tensor product of the degrees of freedom of the central product, the central particle, and the Fox space of exactly this space, this vector space here, J gamma C uh, gamma H uh, tensor, oh, there's a parenthesis around that to show that it's a vector space, tensor H sub gamma H where my notation here is the following, f of a vector space means that you take that vector space and you choose a basis and you write down creation operators for each of the basis vectors in the vector space. Okay, and then you take the Fox space based on that set of creation operators. Is there any question? I often find that physicists have trouble with that notation. Of course, F is not to be confused with the uh, electromagnetic field or the prepotential. It's a Fox space. Is it just well, that's a very nice question. If all my creation operators are bosonic, it's just a symmetric product, indeed. So uh, this, we're talking about this F of W. W, in general, is going to be a Z2 graded Fox space for the bosonic creation operators and the fermionic creation operators. And F of a Fox space is the tensor product of the Fox spaces of the bosons and the fermions. And the bosons, as you say, is the symmetric algebra on W symmetric polynomials on W, and the, for the fermions, of course, we get the anti-symmetric product of W. Okay? And uh, <coughs> indeed, what is the Z2 grading here? The Z2 grading is rather tricky. You see, you might have thought that the hypermultiplet gave you a boson in the Fox space. You might have thought that because, you know, after all, for a hypermultiplet, uh, H is equal to 0, 0. But don't forget that center of mass that I crossed out, and it had a spin. It had to be in the spin a half state, and that spin a half had to point inward. So there's a shift in the Z2 grading. So the hypermultiplets turn out to be fermions. And the vector multiplets with h equals 1 half 0 turn out to be bosons in my Fox space. Rather surprising. OK. One more little thing I have to say here is I've worked this out for a single halo. I've said this for a single halo particle of charge gamma h here. But of course, we can also. You see, we have this lambda j here, so we could have particles of charge n gamma h for any n, and so we should take the tensor product from n equals 1 to infinity with n gamma h. So that finally is the halo Fox space. Yeah? Uh, no, 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 no. Because supersymmetry doesn't tell me how many hypermultiplets and how many vector multiplets I have. I'm not saying just because this is a Z2 graded Fox space doesn't mean it's supersymmetric. By no means am I saying there are as many fermionic oscillators as there are bosonic oscillators. Well, we're talking about supersymmetric theories, but you know we've we've gone a long way um, in terms of analysis here and. The fermion creation operators are associated with the hypermultiplets. 
and the bosonic creation operators are associated with the vector multiplets. The supersymmetry, if you like, that you're talking about is acting within the hypermultiplets and within the vector multiplets. We've already taken account of supersymmetry. But n equals 2 is symmetric between the two. No, 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 no. n equals 2 has to do with the fact that this is a represent, you know, these things define representations of the n equals 2 algebra separately. There's no supersymmetry telling me relating these bosonic and fermionic halo creation operators. Absolutely not. They're just, you know, we can have different numbers of fermionic and bosonic, we can have different numbers of hypermultiplets. We have perfectly good n equals 2 theories with only hypermultiplets in them. Does that break the supersymmetry? No, no, no. It just means they're only hypermultiplets. And then if I make halos, then I'll only see fermionic particles in the halo. All right. So, <clears throat> yeah, one more thing to say, which is the net number, yeah, um, the net number of, of fermionic fermionic minus bosonic oscillators, which is the supertrace of that W over there, is equal to uh, gamma C N gamma H absolute value omega, the BPS index of N gamma H. Okay? So the net number of oscillators is this BPS index for this charge here. OK, so now we're ready to talk about the semi-primitive wall crossing formula. So now suppose that we cross a wall of marginal stability for this core charge gamma C and halo charge gamma H. So we cross a wall of marginal stability for that. What happens? Well, we might lose a bound state. You know, we have this uh, imaginary part going to zero. And that means that not only do we lose the bound state of gamma C with gamma H, we lose the bound state of gamma C with any number of particles proportional to gamma H. We lose the entire Fox space, or gain it, depending on which direction we went. So we gain or lose the entire Fox space. So let's write a generating function that accounts for this. Okay? And to do that, we introduce some variables, some formal variables. X gamma, where X gamma 1 times X gamma 2 is X gamma 1 plus X gamma 2. Just some formal variables. Mathematically, it's called the group algebra on the lattice capital gamma. So you see from this equation that if we choose a basis, gamma i for my lattice capital gamma, and define variables little xi is x of gamma i, then if gamma is an integer multiple, uh, integer combination of these basis vectors, then x sub gamma is just a Laurent monomial of the xi's. Okay? So our generating function is going to be some kind of Laurent function in these formal variables xi. Okay, so we've got those things. And now we define, let's call it the halo generating function with central core charge gamma C, and it depends on U, and it's going to be the sum of the contribution of these Fox space states, let's call it omega Fox, to the index. Okay, that's a definition. Okay, so now how does this thing change? What's the wall crossing of this? Well, I 
from what I've said, I hope the following is pretty clear. So if we're on the unstable wall, let's suppose on the unstable side of the wall, OK, there's no halo Fox space. And here, g of gamma c is just going to be x gamma c. Boring, right? Okay. There's no Fox space, just the ground state, if you like. But on this side, on the stable side, what do we get? Well, we get g gamma c is going to be equal to the partition function of that Fox space. And what's the partition function? If I'm just measuring the BPS index, it's gamma h gamma c x gamma h to the power the net number of fermions minus bosons omega of gamma h at the point u marginal stability where I crossed. And this multiplies x gamma c. Well, again, that's for a single particle, a Fox space particle of type gamma h. And now, again, I can have Fox space particles of charge n gamma h. And so I should really put in a product from n equals 1 to infinity here of n gamma h, this to the nth power, n gamma h, n gamma h. OK, so gc then goes to this times g gamma c. And that is the semi-primitive wall crossing formula. So we either gain or lose this kind of Fox space partition function as we cross the wall of marginal stability for gamma c and gamma h. Is there any question about that? Yeah. Uh, that's the same question I got before. The, these, OK, the representation of supersymmetry is the HBPS. And that's the rho half hypermultiplet tensor with the H, the little h. So the rho half hypermultiplet is what carried the representations of the n equals 2 supersymmetry algebra. And that's been frozen by our situation. We're just counting particles, and what we see is that you know, after we've frozen out that center of mass degree to freedom, we still have this family of solutions, and so a family of quantum states. It's exactly the same question I was getting before. And um, this, you, know, you should not be trying to make these Fox spaces supersymmetric. I'll have to think about how to make that clearer. <coughs> What? I think in n equals 4, if we made a, a Fox space picture, it would be exactly the same thing. We would be factoring out the Fox space, the, the center of mass degree of freedom. There is no supersymmetry relating the number, the, relating the hypermultiplets equals the vector multiplets. Look, damn it. Just think about an n equals 2 theory. Yeah, so they act on the row. OK, and the row has been frozen. We're just counting supermultiplets. We're just counting supermultiplets. We're just interested in counting BPS indices. OK? You, uh, yes, sir. So the radio, I know that from these uh, the constraint equations on the centers. So you see, if all of these charges are parallel, then all of the terms here are 0 except for one term. And so you have n equations, but they all give the same radius because there's a, um, because, because the lambda j cancels out. You see, you're going to have a lambda gamma h gamma c here over the x of the lambda gamma h minus the x of gamma c. Okay, that's going to be equal to twice the imaginary part of e to the minus alpha infinity 
z sub lambda gamma h of u infinity. OK? Now, z is linear. Lambda is positive. So I can just cancel that. OK? So all of these particles, that's what I asserted before, that if I choose a certain collection of, of these centers, then they're all going to sit at the same radius. Yeah? So what we've done now is calculate the one person formula for this particular compound um, state. Good point. We've only calculated the contribution of these particular kinds of quantum states to the index and how the co that contribution changes. So it looks like we haven't done a whole lot, but I promise you this picture is going to give us the whole thing. Yes, sir? Uh, does it say anything about the one person in the H theory? Absolutely, it does. So that's the first thing I said. I said that there's an argument that conceptually is the same in gauge theory and in supergravity. The argument in gauge theory uses these supersymmetric line operators, but that argument is conceptually extremely close to the one I'm trying to give, where we have Fox spaces, the Fox spaces come and go, and, well, you'll see the rest of the argument. There's a perfect parallel. The same thing we can do Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. So, um, yeah, so that, in fact, historically came first, and then we realized, oh my god, we could do the same thing in supergravity. And did you, did you, uh, last time you illustrated the uh, primitive wall crossing formula for the case of cyber did you illustrate this formula for the case of cyber and FQI? Um, I'm going to do that at the end, if I get there. Yeah. Yeah. And how will you justify it? Because some of the charges. Yeah, OK, well. I um, know uh, I can't. Um, I'm just going to quote BPS at you. Right. <laughs> I'm just going to say that since we're dealing with supersymmetric quanti uh, quantities, often you um, get nice exact answers, even when there are quantum corrections. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point. There are quantum corrections to this to the equations of motion and probably quantum corrections to the uh, supersymmetry transformation laws. And I don't know if the Deneff solution, you know, it could be that the Deneff solution is so beautiful that it actually solves the all order alpha prime corrections. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't be too surprised yeah. if that actually happened. Um, yes, as, a, as I've stressed, that's, that's a funny thing. Yeah, I agree. But you know, there's this, there's this other argument that doesn't rely on DNF that uh, I think is mathematically much more rigorous in terms of the supersymmetric line operators in field theory. Okay? And while well, I'm saying it's conceptually the same, it's based not on the multicentered solutions, but on the supersymmetric line operators, much more rigorous. There I don't have any problem with alpha prime corrections at all. By definition, I'm talking about a supersymmetric line operator. And there we really get the motivic formula. And I think that Konsevich and Teubelman do have somewhat rigorous arguments for certain classes of non-compact Calabiaus and for um, quiver, you know, quiver quantum mechanics and things like that, which have to do with non-compact Calabiaus and field theories. So they do have real rigorous arguments in some cases. They do not have a rigorous argument in the case of compact Calabiaus. There are some unjustified steps there. So it's a very interesting situation. OK, but to return to um, the semi-primitive wall crossing formula. Um, how am I doing for time? Oh, my god. Um, <clears throat> OK. I'm going to skip a nice example of the semi-primitive wall crossing formula, where you really nicely get the uh, McMahon function, which some of you probably know from topological string theory. It just falls out into your lap in a very beautiful way, but in view of the time, I'm going to skip it. Because I want to get to the main point. The main point being the konsevich soibelman formula. OK, so, 
So as uh, I had a good question before, you know, stressing that this is only you know, a contribution to omega, right? These are only these particular Fox space uh, states that we're accounting for. And in particular, if we look at omega of gamma C plus n gamma H, U, that's not equal to the product of the core times the halo, uh, the contribution of the halos to n gamma U. Those are just not equal. There are other configurations. What kind of other configurations do we have to worry about? Well, for example, I mean, we could take, we could just do something very simple. We're supposing we have n gamma C, we have gamma C here and n gamma H, and what if we subtract off m gamma h and put m gamma h in here? Same total charge. OK, I changed the core charge a little bit. Well, in all orders of perturbation theory, my quantum mechanical system there does not see that. But this can mix with the other one through tunneling. OK? This could mix through tunneling. And similarly, I could do something like I could just add some random charge delta here and some minus delta here. And maybe there's a, maybe there's a bound state like that. Maybe it's not a Fox space. Uh, maybe it's not a halo configuration. But maybe I could have charges orbiting this with, total, th with this total charge. Not in a halo configuration, but it's a more complicated multi-centered solution. Those could also contribute to omega. What about them? Maybe they change, too. Maybe they decay. So this is the problem. This is why the semi-primitive semi wall-crossing formula is not the whole story. But the idea we had is that we can suppress this kind of mixing. We can suppress this mixing. and make a closed system by taking a very heavy core charge. OK, so let me try and make that precise. So we choose a U1. OK, and choose an electric and a magnetic charge, gamma naught and gamma naught prime, so that they have in our product gamma naught, gamma naught prime equals 1. And supposing our core charge looks like lambda squared gamma naught plus lambda gamma naught prime plus some delta. And we're going to, set, we're going to send lambda goes to infinity. We're going to send lambda going to infinity. And in that case, I claim that these complications go away, although we have to define a slightly different kind of BPS index, something we call a framed BPS index. So again, the framed BPS index is a concept that first came up in, super, in supersymmetric field theory in terms of BPS particles bound to a line operator. And there it's, I dare say, more rigorous than what I'm about to define. But I'm pretty confident that the frame PPS indices I'm about to define are also make sense. And now I'll tell you what those are. <laughs> OK, so we're going to send lambda goes to infinity. Well, what is delta? Well, delta is any vector you like in the orthogonal lattice to the electric and magnetic charges in this U1. So by definition, that's the set of gamma such that gamma gamma naught is gamma gamma naught prime is 0. Okay, So that's some lattice of rank 2R. OK. So now we, I say consider all BPS configurations 
with core charge gamma c and all other charges uh, gamma i in gamma naught perpendicular. So you see, this is not this is not the kind of halo configurations anymore, because I'm not I'm not saying that these are all proportional. They're just all sitting in this orthogonal lattice. They could be have non-zero inner products among themselves. So now if we go and try and solve these constraints on the centers, it's going to be very complicated. So we should think, how should we think about this thing? It's a good analogy is that it's like a galaxy, like our galaxy. We've got this supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And now if we think about the solar systems orbiting that galaxy, well, it's not true that you can take Jupiter and Mars and just distribute them wherever you like around the galaxy, around the sphere, around the black hole of the galaxy. I mean, that's ridiculous. You're all smiling, right? You know, <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. That's because Jupiter and Mars are part of a solar system, which is itself a bound state, okay, sitting inside this much bigger bound state. And so that's what the picture should be. So we call these things BPS galaxies. OK? And I claim that these B, this ensemble of BPS galaxies that I've defined is a closed system. And you know, 90 percent of our paper, 90 percent of the work on our paper is giving reasonable physical arguments for why that should be. This is not supposed to be obvious. And especially in view of the time, let me, I just want to give you a, a taste of the basic new physical insight that allows us to think that this is true. So the idea is that there's entropic suppression of the k's of black holes. You know, if you take the Schwarzschild black hole and you take its mass goes to infinity, temperature is 1 over m and it becomes stable, right? So if you take a supermassive black hole, it becomes more and more stable. If you take a Reisner-Nordstrom black hole, an extremal Reisner-Nordstrom black hole of charge Q, OK? There is absolutely no potential barrier for it to break up into two Reisner-Nordstrom black holes of charge Q1 plus Q2. So why don't, you know, why doesn't it just decay? It doesn't. And why not? Well, the point is that there's this big entropic barrier, which is e to the minus pi Q squared minus Q1 squared minus Q2 squared which is e to the minus 2 pi q1, q2. Now, charge is quantized. So q1 and q2 can't go to 0, right? So therefore, if the charge goes to infinity, if the black hole becomes very massive, then this tunneling event is exponentially suppressed. So that's why this. That's why this big massive black hole of charge gamma c at the center of our BPS galaxies can't mix with anything. It's that style of argument. That there are further arguments. You can probably think of some special cases you're worried about. I refer you to our paper. Let's just say that we're right, that this is a closed system. And I'll show you how the konsevich soibelman formula comes out. So, now we want to account for the degrees of freedom in this BPS galaxy, OK? So we've got this H gamma C plus, let's call it gamma orb um, of, of U. And what's gamma orb? Well, so we have this big fat black hole, gamma C here, and we have all sorts of complicated stuff around it. And the total charge of that complicated stuff is gamma orb. Now, the degrees of freedom, of course, include the degrees of freedom of the black hole at the center. We're not interested in that. So this is a subspace, so let's just quotient by this. And by definition, we'll call this h sub gamma c of gamma orb. And it depends on u because there's wall crossing. So we call this the space of framed BPS states. 
this space here. It's the space of framed BPS states. And there's a framed BPS index, which we denote this way, omega bar sub gamma c of gamma orb and u, which is the limit as lambda goes to infinity of the trace of this h gamma c. Remember, gamma, a, gamma c depends on lambda, and my physical arguments depend crucially on taking the lambda to infinity limit of minus 1 to the 2j3. OK? So that's the framed BPS index. So now we come to another key point. These BPS galaxies are very complicated things. The ensemble of BPS galaxies are very complicated things, but their wall crossing is, similar, is simple, as I'll show you. Now you might say, wait a second, there's a bait and switch here. I, didn't, I came into this lecture wanting to know about the wall crossing of BPS states, not frame BPS states. What are you giving me? Hang on. So, well, I'll show you that accounting for the wall crossing of the frame BPS states actually controls the wall crossing of the original vanilla BPS states that you are interested in. OK, so let's therefore make a, a galaxy generating function, a BPS galaxy generating function, where we sum over gamma orb in gamma naught perpendicular of the framed BPS indices. Okay, maybe we could call it the bait and switch function. Okay, so we've got that. And now what happens when you, cr well, what kind of wall crossing can there be? Well, we know from this, uh, we, we know from, from what we've said before that a particular BPS galaxy is going to have wall crossing when some charge, some populated charge, say gamma, becomes parallel to z of gamma c plus gamma orb u. But now, because we're taking lambda goes to infinity, the wall crossing is going to happen in the lambda goes to infinity limit when this charge is parallel to z gamma naught u. And so, the dependence on the complicated charge surrounding this goes away. And it only depends on this gamma naught, the big charge inside gamma C. So we'll call this thing W gamma, and we'll call that a BPS wall. Okay? So what we learn is that the framed BPS states cross so have wall crossing when we cross a BPS wall. OK. And now, how do the frame BPS states change? Well, so here's, here's our BPS galaxy, OK? Some complicated thing. And suppose we cross a wall W gamma. So then our halo, our halo of gamma particles is coming in from infinity. OK, so we have gamma H, gamma particles out here coming in from infinity, much larger than the galaxy. So it's exactly the same story as before. We've got a Fox space here, OK? And so the galaxy wall crossing formula is just going to get multiplied by 1 minus minus 1 to the gamma gamma total x gamma to the gamma gamma total omega of gamma u. Now that's the vanilla BPS index, the one we're interested in, in and that multiplies g, the galaxy generating function. OK? Where what's gamma total? Ah, sorry. I made a mistake. That's not how the whole galaxy partition function changes. That's how one term, call this gamma total here, that's how one term changes. That's important. So x gamma changes by this factor. Um, sorry. 
x gamma total changes by that factor. OK, sorry, now I have it right. Are there any questions? I made a few missteps there. So maybe I confuse people. This is a correct statement now. Are there questions? Oh dear, I've confused everybody. Can you think of a question? You're just so completely confused. You see, I'm. I'm, uh, I'm, when I talk about a particular BPS galaxy, I'm talking about a particular term in this sum here. OK? And so now I'm saying, let's think about crossing this BPS wall. Well, you know, these are out at infinity. And out at infinity, even a galaxy looks like a, you know, just some point. And it, it carries a charge, gamma total. Now, you might object that it's gamma C plus gamma orb, not delta plus gamma orb. We'll take care of that in a second. OK. But you know these, these halos, they don't care. They're way, way out there. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up, in our set of frame BPS states, we're going to pick up these kinds of halo states. OK? No, you don't believe me. Ask a question. Yes? Is that the only thing you can pick up if I trace my galaxy to some kind of point and then you can get into this uh, heavy space? It's the only thing we can pick up across W gamma because that's, you know, that's the only, across that wall, that's the only kind of thing that can come in. I've got this core and I've got this gamma. Yeah, I've got this halo. Well, that's why I'm leaving room here so I can take the product over n of all things proportional to gamma. But other than that, nothing else can come in. OK, well, <clears throat> this is how the individual terms change. OK? And um, now you see that there's a bit of a nuisance here. Well, let me actually take care of this little detail. Uh, you see a delta plus gamma orb there. And I wrote gamma t up there, and then I wrote gamma t equals gamma c plus gamma orb here. Did I make a mistake? No, I did not. Because you see, gamma gamma t is equal to gamma uh, delta plus gamma orb precisely because gamma is in this orthogonal space, orthogonal to the heavy charges. So I didn't make a mistake there. But you do see something that's kind of annoying. When we wrote the semi-primitive wall crossing formula, it was nice and simple, right? We had a generating function. It simply got multiplied by a certain Fox space partition function times the generating function. But now, how I change x sub gamma t depends on gamma t, right? So it's not some simple overall factor because the different terms here are getting multiplied by different Fox space factors. Is that clear? Ahoy! Come on! <laughs> yeah, OK. All right, so, all right, so, so the different terms are getting multiplied by different Fox space factors. It depends on gamma t. Isn't that annoying? It's not annoying. It's deep. What we should do, what we should do is we should introduce a differential operator. So let's introduce d sub gamma for crossing the wall, w sub gamma, acting on x gamma prime is gamma gamma prime x sub gamma prime. And let's now introduce another differential operator, k sub gamma, which is 1 minus minus 1 to the d sub gamma x gamma to the d sub gamma, that's a differential operator acting on the little x's. And now notice that k sub gamma makes no reference to gamma sub t. 
okay? And every term in the sum changes by this action of this differential operator. And therefore, the galaxy generating function jumps across the BPS wall by the action of this differential operator. Now this case of gamma has a name. It's called a kontsevich soivelman transformation. It satisfies a lot of nice properties. And I wrote an exercise in the notes where you can play around with that. But let's just observe that the galaxy generating function changes by k sub gamma, well, to the omega, this is important, to the omega of gamma u acting on g sub gamma of u. Now, omega of gamma u, that's an integer. It could be plus or minus, but these are invertible transformations. In fact, they're diffeomorphisms. In fact, more than that, they're symplectomorphisms, as you show in the exercise. OK, so now the other detail we need to get straight is that when we cross this BPS wall W sub gamma, not only can particles of charge gamma come in in halos, but of course, charges, particles of charge n gamma for any n can come in as halos. So we should have written product from n equals 1 to infinity just as before. And that's x gamma to the n. And so here we should put an n gamma, n gamma, product from n equals 1 to infinity. So this is just some product of differential operators. OK? And let's just call that u sub gamma of little u. OK? g sub gamma of u. So g sub gamma c of u goes to that differential operator on g sub gamma of u. OK? That's what happens to the framed BPS degeneracies as we cross the wall w gamma. OK. Now one more little point. Let's just choose some general, some nice generic smooth point in moduli space. And let's just choose some small closed path P, OK? And consider the behavior of G sub gamma of U as we move around this small path P. So we're just taking some completely innocuous place in moduli space and taking the G sub gamma around some little small curve, OK? So what happens? It's a completely nice, innocuous point. No singularities in sight. What's going to happen to my function? This curve is as small as I like. Nothing. Nothing. That's exactly what I want to hear. Right. Nothing happens as I go around. But wait a second. It might be intersecting lots of walls. W gamma 1, W gamma 2, W gamma 3, at U1, U2, U3, and so on. So what, acts, what also happens is it changes by the path-ordered product of u sub gamma i of u i acting on g gamma c. But as you correctly said, nothing happens. So that's true. Now, you know, I had a lot of freedom in my, uh, in my core charge. Is it still here? Yeah. I have this little delta here. So this g sub gamma c is basically any function, OK? So that means that I can, I can cancel this g of gamma c. It's just any function of x. This is some differential operator. So it means that this product of differential operators is equal to 1. Well, those are these kontsevich soibelman diffeomorphisms raised to integer powers. And what are those integer powers? Those are the BPS degeneracies. So that's a strong condition on the BPS indices. And now to finish up, if I can have 10 minutes, I can show you the kontsevich soibelman how the kontsevich soibelman formula comes out of that. So um, I'm five minutes over time. Um, <coughs> pardon?
Um, look, anyone who's not interested, just go, OK? <laughs> you don't have to stay. But I'm going to finish. And I, I, I expect that a few people are interested. So I'm going to show you that this implies the Kontsevich Simone wall crossing formula. OK. <clears throat> so how's that? Well, the kontsevich Schleibelman wall crossing formula is not about crossing BPS walls. As I said, that was bait and switch. It's about crossing a wall of marginal stability of gamma 1 with gamma 2 and understanding what happens to the actual omegas as we cross that. So let's take this wall and let's just choose some generic smooth point U marginal stability on that wall. Okay. And now we're going to do the following. There's some technical points which you can find in the paper. And I'm just going to make them as assertions here. Yeah, let me put them here. First point. There exists a charge gamma naught, which will be in our core charge, such that uh, U marginal stability, which we just chose at random, is the attractor point of that gamma naught, and gamma naught supports a black hole. OK? And moreover, at that point, z gamma 1 of u marginal stability is parallel to z gamma 2 of u marginal stability. And why is that? Why is this true? Because it's the definition of the wall of marginal stability. I'm just checking. OK, and so that's parallel. Now, here's the non-trivial statement. To e to the i alpha naught, which is equal to z of gamma naught u, marginal stability. OK? And since those are parallel to uh, z of gamma naught, that means that these BPS walls, w gamma 1 and w gamma 2, go through this point. Now, colored chalk would be great. Yeah. And the other thing, the other thing I'll tell you in a second. So, um, so W gamma 1 and W gamma 2 are each real codimension 1 walls and moduli space. So their intersection point is real codimension 2. And transverse to real codimension 2 is a real two-dimensional plane. And that real two-dimensional plane is the plane of the blackboard. Okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to implement that criterion up there with a, little tr with a little path curly p. Okay? And so the other technical thing I have to tell you is that um, if you were at the discussion section yesterday, I talked about a simple root property. And if you weren't at the discussion session, what that means uh, is that the only relevant BPS walls are, let's call W sub R1, R2 is the wall for R1 gamma 1 plus R2 gamma 2, where R1 and R2 are greater than or equal to 0. So now what we want to do is we want, uh, we want to implement the uh, the, the constraint in the box there for this particular kind of path. So what's going to happen? <coughs> so we've got my colored chalk. Okay, so we've got, say, walls gamma 1 and W gamma 2 here. See, how do I want it? W gamma 2 here and W gamma 1 here. And we're going through some wall of marginal stability for gamma 1, gamma 2. 
Okay, so where are the other walls that we have to worry about? Well, they're going to be in between here. There might be many of them. So this is going to be W of R1, R2. And uh, let's think about why that's true. So if we're in the Z plane, right, if you, if you have, if you have Z1 and Z2 like this, so Z1 is counterclockwise to Z2 and um, of angle less than pi, that's the, exactly the same statement as to say that the imaginary part of Z1, Z2 bar is greater than or equal to zero. And now ask yourself, if I take the complex number R1, Z1 plus R2, Z2, where does that complex number sit? Okay. Well, using this remark here, you can see that they all sit in this cone here. Okay, so this is Z sub R1, R2. And moreover, as you move in a counterclockwise uh, direction, R, the ratio R1 over R2 is increasing. See, that's kind of obvious, right? If R1 is going to infinity, then this complex number is becoming more and more parallel to Z1. If R2 is going to infinity, then this complex number is becoming more and more parallel to Z2. So that means that we have these walls here. This, remember, is in the Coulomb branch. Okay? And as we cross in this direction, R1 over R2 is increasing. And uh, similarly, this is still the wall W gamma 2 here. And this is still the wall W gamma 1 down here. And R1 over R2 is increasing here. OK, now on this side of the wall, let's say that the imaginary part of Z1, Z2 bar is greater than 0. And on this side of the wall, the imaginary part of Z1, Z2 bar is less than 0. Now, we're, we're focusing on an infinitesimally small region around this U marginal stability. So there's not going to be any wall crossing for gamma 1 and gamma 2 separately, only for the bound states of gamma 1 and gamma 2. So we'll have an unambiguous omega minus of R1, R2 in this half plane, which is omega of R1, gamma 1 plus R2, gamma 2, and U for U in this half plane. And similarly, an unambiguous omega plus sub R1, R2 on, in this half plane. OK, now we are ready to write our, 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 uh, our constraint up here. And it says that if I take the product, so as I multiply terms to the left, R1 over R2 is increasing. I'll have k sub gamma R1 R2 to the omega minus. That's for crossing all the walls in this region here. Times, and then I keep going, and I cross the walls in here, and I get the product. So as I multiply on the, to the left, I again have R1 over R2 increasing of k sub gamma R1 R2 to the omega plus r1, r2 is equal to 1. And now here I've actually made a little mistake. Uh, and you see, I didn't tell you one thing. You could have asked a question here. You see, when we cross this, when we make this uh, transformation here, you could have asked, well, that, that goes for crossing the wall in which direction, right? I mean, if I cross the wall in one direction, if I multiply by this operator, then if I cross the wall in the other direction, I should multiply by the inverse of this operator, right? So when I write a formula like that, I have to give you a rule for which direction I'm crossing the wall. And the rule is that when I'm crossing the wall, says so the argument of e to the minus i alpha naught z gamma is increasing. OK, I get k to the plus omega. And when it's the other way around, I get k to the minus omega. 
And so if you follow through, you'll see that there's a minus sign there. And now that is our constraint. OK, so this formula can be rewritten a little bit as the product ordered to the right so that the, um, the phase of the central charges is increasing of k sub gamma r1 r2 to the omega plus r1 r2 is the product or, um, or ordered to the right so that the argument of z r1 r2 is increasing of k sub gamma r1 r2 to the omega minus of gamma r1 r2. And this is indeed the kontsevich soibelman wall crossing formula. OK. So now I've shown you that our constraint here actually derives the kontsevich soibelman wall crossing formula. In fact, it gives a generalization of the kontsevich soibelman wall crossing formula. Let me just finish up by giving you a little bit of a sense of what this equation is saying. So, <clears throat> so if, we, uh, if we write this out, this equation says something like this. I have k gamma 2 to the omega in this side of the wall, dot, 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 k gamma 1 to the omega on that side of the wall is k omega minus gamma 1, dot, 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 k gamma 2, omega minus of gamma 2. So why is it a wall crossing formula? Well, supposing you know the BPS degeneracies omega minus. OK? So you know the BPS degeneracies, let's say, omega minus. Well, you work out this product. OK? Now you want to know the BPS degeneracies omega plus. That's what a wall crossing formula does. It says if you know omega minus, you can calculate omega plus. How do you do it? You take this big diffeomorphism, in fact, simplectomorphism, and you say, no, 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 I want to write it in this order, with k to the gamma 2 here and k to the gamma 1, and k sub r1 gamma 1 plus r2 gamma 2, ordered so that as I move to the left, r2 over r1, say, is increasing, which is the opposite order from here. Well, these things are non-commutative, these k's. There's diffeomorphisms that are non-commutative. So I have to raise these things to different integer powers. And there's a unique way of, given a simplectomorphism, there's a unique way of writing it as an ordered product of kontsevich soibelman k's. And therefore, the omega pluses are uniquely determined in terms of the omega minuses. That's why it's called the ks wall crossing formula. That's why it is a wall crossing formula. Now let me just finish up with two very simple illustrations. Supposing that gamma is equal to z gamma 1 direct sum z gamma 2, and the inner product of gamma 1 and gamma 2 is 1. And supposing on one side of the wall I know I have two hypermultiplets of charges gamma 1 and gamma 2. Okay? I want to know what is the spectrum on the other side of the wall. Well, this is some explicit differential operator. And now what I want to do is I need to write it as gamma 2, dot, 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 gamma 1. And when the inner product gamma 1, gamma 2 is 1, it turns out to be a very simple exercise. You can do it with a few lines of algebra to show that that's true. So that's the identity of these differential operators. And what you learn from that mathematical identity is that if you have hypermultiplet spectrum here with omega minus of gamma 1 equals plus 1, omega minus of gamma 2 equals plus 1, omega minus of gamma equals 0, else you just read off the omegas here. This identity, mathematical identity, implies that omega plus of gamma 2 is plus 1, omega plus of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 is plus 1, and omega plus of gamma 1 is plus 1, and omega plus of gamma is 0 for everybody else. So that shows you that I can really deduce the wall cross, you know, the, the, the spectrum on the other side of the wall. 
And so the other example I want to give <coughs> is when we do the same thing in rank 2, but now gamma 1 inner product gamma 2 is plus 2. So what happens there? Supposing I, I know that on one side of the spectrum I have two hypermultiplets of charges gamma 1, gamma 2. I want to ask myself, what is the spectrum on the other side of the wall? So I, I have these differential operators. I now I attempt to write this <coughs> I could use a little more space. So let me write it on this board. <coughs> Okay, so I have gamma 1, gamma 2 equals 2. Okay, I happen to know that there are, are hypermultiplets of charges gamma 1 and gamma 2. On one side of the wall, I want to know what's on the other side of the wall, so I start trying to write identities. I try to write gamma 2, gamma 1. Maybe I put a k gamma 1 plus gamma 2. No, it doesn't work. Okay. What works, I told you, that once you've chosen an ordering, there's a unique product with that ordering. What works is this. That's just a mathematical identity on these diffeomorphisms. Now, do you recognize something here? Does it remind you of something? This is the zyberg witten spectrum in weak coupling. So here we had omega minus of gamma 1 equals 1, omega minus of gamma 2 equals 1. This is for SU2 NF equals 0. We crossed the wall, and what did we find? We found omega plus of n gamma 1 plus n plus 1 gamma 2 equals plus 1. Omega plus of n plus 1 gamma 1 plus n gamma 2 equals plus 1. And omega plus of gamma 1 plus gamma 2 is minus 2, and everything else is 0. Remember, omega is minus 2 for a vector multiplet and omega is plus 1 for a hypermultiplet. And so, from this identity on diffeomorphisms, we've extracted the, uh, the, the, the BPS indices in the weak coupling Zyberg-Witten region. That's a good place to end. So thank you.